Good morning, church. Good to see all of you and for all of you joining us online. My name is Helen Kim Nowak, and I'm pastor of Community Life here at New Life. And just as a reminder, starting next week, exciting news, we're going to two services, not four, two. <laughs> and so it'll be at 9 and 11 a.m. No 10.30, 9 and 11 a.m. And for those of you joining us through live stream, the 11 a.m. will be what is live stream. So please come online then to worship with us. And for those of you who are parents, the nursery is available in both services. And the kids ministry will be operating during the 11 a.m. service. So don't forget, next week you have two options. Exciting. <laughs> All right. Well, we've been in a series on the spiritual disciplines. And we've been looking at five so far. And today we wrap up with the six. Discipline. There's many more, but we've looked at silence, meditation, serving, confession, and fasting. And today we'll be looking at simplicity. Uh, Richard Foster, a Christian author and theologian, says superficiality is the curse of this age. And how true, because we have so many things coming at us, so many things we're streaming and scrolling constantly, right, that to stay on top of it all, how can we ever go deep? We're just so caught up that we can only stay on the surface. But to live on the surface is like unfermented wine, not quite the rich thing. A frozen TV dinner. <laughs> it's not very good. I mean, we can put up with it here and there, but not, not what it's meant to be. Food is supposed to be so much more. And it's like living a skimmed life, constantly just flicking through without ever really going deep. And so the spiritual disciplines are not rules and chores and regulations, but they're really a way to practice staying connected to God in a world that pushes and pulls at us and distracts us, and there's so many things coming at us. There are ways for us to stay tethered to the heartbeat of God and to stay tethered to his voice. And so they're incredibly important, and today we'll be looking at the spiritual discipline of simplicity. So let's read today from Matthew chapter 6, verses 24 to 34. It says, No one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you'll be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Can any one of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your life? And why do you worry about clothes? See how the flowers of the field grow. They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? So do not worry, saying, what shall we eat? Or what shall we drink? Or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Let's pray. Father, we come before you. And Holy Spirit, we just ask that as we come to your word now, that you would free us to see you in a fresh new way. And whatever you have for each of us, because you do have a word for each of us, and you want to encounter us, may we encounter you in the truths that you speak to us in these passages. We pray all of this in your son, Jesus' name. Amen. When I was in middle school, I had an English teacher who taught me the acronym K-I-S-S. -S. Keep it simple, stupid. <laughs> and apart from the shock, my teacher said the word stupid to us. Um, it was really a sticky acronym that really helped me understand what writing was about. He was getting really tired of us 
fulfilling our obligations for homework of like three pages, 10 pages, all those paragraphs of really fluffy statements. You know, we would basically write the same thing in about as many ways as we could come up so that we could just uh, complete the assignment, hand it in as many interesting words, as many angles we could take on it. And he just said, K-I-S-S, -S, stay focused and say your main point and stick with it. And from that, I truly learned, it really stayed with me, that acronym, that good writing is not about fancy words. Good writing is just getting the point across. It's just about staying focused and clear and communicating that point. And that's what simplicity does. It just removes unnecessary layers to help us hone in on what is truly important. Simplicity removes all the complexity. And sometimes in our world where we live here today, in our Western world, we have so many things coming at us that even when we think we live the simple life, we probably aren't. We're constantly bombarded with choices that make us think we need to have more and we think about more and having more. Um, and the way this really came home to me one day and has just stayed with me is that I had a seminary professor in college who had been a missionary for decades in Southeast Asia. And he told us about a time when he and his family came back for furlough to just stay for a summer or so here in the States. And their family needed groceries, so they went to the grocery store. And when they got to the grocery store and they got to the cereal aisle to get some stuff for breakfast, they broke down. And they just couldn't finish, and they just exited the store without grocery shopping. And the reason was this photo. Ever been to the cereal aisle? We have like 50 plus choices, if not more. And even then, sometimes we go, why don't they have what I like? <laughs> you know, but it's really kind of sick if you really think about it. The reason their family couldn't take it was where they lived, it was really simple. You went to the store, and if you needed something, there was one option, and maybe two. And that was a big deal if there was two. But to come back home and then go to the grocery store and see what is normal here, that there's 50 plus types of stores and there's this amount of you know, puffy sugar and this is one in a frog shape and this one's in a, you know, like it, it's just too much. And I think his story made me see, oh my gosh, I do live in a world where I accept and even buy into that this is good to have. But he made me see that this is actually adding so much complexity and consumerism that just crowds my heart to not be able to see what truly matters. Instead, I focus on why can't I have more? Why don't they have what I want? Rather than focusing on, oh wow, I have food to eat. And so this story just captures for me what simplicity is. And there's something about choices that fragments our focus. Many, many choices keep us from staying focused. They fragment, it divides our attention. We can no longer stay zoned in on anything. We need to stay here, look here. And we see that in the next generation as they're coming up, you know, keeping up with so many different devices and apps and things, it's hard to stay focused. And undivided attention is a really difficult thing in our age. And so simplicity brings us back. It helps us to recognize that, you know what? We don't need to have it all. There's only one thing that is truly important. And all this other stuff is what crowds in and tries to prevent us from seeing it. Simplicity essentially frees our interior heart space to be able to be focused and available for what God has for us, him and his kingdom, rather than being enslaved to things. And so there's a great definition from R Richard Foster and Dallas Willard about simplicity, and they tie it with frugality, because simplicity is very much interlocked with our posture and interaction with money. They say, they describe it as the inward reality of single-hearted focus upon God and his kingdom which results in an outward lifestyle of modesty, openness, and unpretentiousness, and which disciplines our hunger for status, glamor, and luxury, 
And in this definition, you see how easily, if we examine ourselves, where are you in this? Where is the hunger? Is there a hunger for status, glamour, luxury? There's so much in our lives that looks to enslave us, consume us. But it really begins, that outward lifestyle of modesty, openness, and unpretentiousness first begins with an inward reality of single-hearted focus. And that is what simplicity is. It begins with that inner posture of single-hearted focus. So in our passage today, we see Jesus talk about how we can't have two masters, God or money, one or the other. And it's really interesting to me that Jesus describes money as a master. It's not a living thing. You know, but there is something about money, isn't there, that consumes us that begins to you know, take over our thoughts and worries, and there's something, soon it does begin to control us. Master is anything that controls us, that we are buying into and swayed by, that consumes us. And so how is money a master? When we, maybe we have a little at first, and then what happens? We're broke college students, then we get a job, and then maybe it's like, well, I, my goal is to just have an emergency fund, just in case, but I'm good with little else. Then we get that emergency fund and we're good now. So it's like, well, now that I have this emergency fund, I want to have savings so that I can buy this, this new gadget, this new phone, this new cool AirPods or whatever the next thing is. I saw a folding phone. I was like, wow, we're gonna start having all kinds of things. Um, but it just there's something about money that makes us want to have more and more. And then as we have more, there becomes a worry and a concern. What if something happens to this? What if my investment doesn't go well? What if, you know, this is not enough and Social Security dies out by the time I retire? Then do I, am I going to survive? And there's something about money that makes us think we have control. So if we have a lot of it, we're going to be okay in life. That it can give us a cushion. It can have set us up to be comfortable in life or for our future to have security. But those are all false statements. And yet there is something about money because it's a constant currency that we deal with and interact with to get anything in life, even to just get cereal or to get a bagel in the morning, right? That makes us, it begins to consume our hearts and our minds. And Jesus makes it very clear that money can become a master. If we don't make a conscious choice to make God our master, to say God is Lord, money can be our master. So my question to you today is, who is your master? Who consumes your thoughts? Who dictates your decisions? Is it money or is it God? And so after Jesus talks about how there requires a choice between money or God, he points to two pictures, really everyday pictures that even us today can kind of relate to, and to show us what it looks like to be free, because our invitation in life as Jesus is a life that is free as a child of God, not an enslaved life. Jesus came to set us free, and without him, we are enslaved to the world, to currency, to money. And so the two pictures are this. The first one is, look at the birds of the air. And you know, it's New York City, so I know we've seen this. The pigeons, okay, not as pretty when you think of it that way. <laughs> but you know, we've seen flocks of pigeons go up in the air, or sparrows, or whatnot. And you know, if you think about it, think about what pigeons do, you know? They strut about, they're so confident, though I don't know why. Um, they constantly have a strut, they got the New York strut going. They have food that they're just eating. They're pecking away all day long. Some of them are quite well fed, as you can see. Um, and then they sleep. They're just so, I've seen so many pigeons just tucked away in the sunlight, you know, <laughs> having a nice nap as the rest of New York City is busily stressed out, running to and fro in the subways. And all around them and all around us are pigeons at rest. You know, so Jesus says, look at the pigeons of New York City. Look at the birds of the air. They don't labor. They don't reap. They don't sow. They're not trying to prepare for the winter. And look at how content and free they are. And God feeds them. 
He makes sure they're all fed. We don't even know when a pigeon dies, right? There's birds that come and go constantly. We're not aware. They're just all around us. And another image Jesus gives us is the flowers of the field. And how stunning. If you ever just pause, even weeds are beautiful, right? There's so much texture and detail. There's little tiny ones that have so many little petals within them. Then there's these big, gigantic, gorgeous ones. But so many flowers of the field, as Jesus says in the passage, are here today, gone tomorrow. And yet the color the detail, the stunning beauty of them. So many of these flowers are in fields or in cracks of sidewalks that we never even notice. They're here today and they're gone tomorrow. And yet God pays attention and puts that much effort and care into these flowers and they grow. Somehow they get water, they get plenty of sunlight and they grow. And sometimes nobody has ever seen them. And if all the more, what a picture of contentment and freedom. To just rest and be, knowing that you're cared for and responding to that care, rather than stressing and hustling and trying to acquire to get to a place where you feel you have defined safety and comfort for your life. But to relax in the care, just like the birds of the air and the flowers of the field in the care of God. And Jesus says, how much more valuable are you than a bird of the air, grass that has a flower? You are so much more precious, so precious he gave his only son. How much more valuable? And yet, who is our master? So often money can easily consume because we feel we need to take care of ourselves. And if we don't, Nobody else will. And the invitation here in the Christian journey is to fall deeper into a deeper trust, a deeper relationship of love with God, where you, it's not just words to say, you know, you'll take care of me. You have always been with me. You have always faithful. But it's truly to let go of acquiring and trying for yourself and say, God has my back. He will take care of my needs. One thing to notice is that Jesus doesn't say, however, that yes, the birds of the air will be fed and the flowers of the field are taken care of, but the birds of the air are not given a buffet. So there is a choice. (laughs) You can have your buffet with worry or you can have a very simple fare that know that God will take care of your basic needs and have that freedom in that, um, which is so much better. But he does not guarantee you'll have me and I guarantee you a buffet. The birds don't get to pick, today I serve you organic granola. You know, um, it's not like that. And the lilies of the field, the flowers, they don't get a walk-in closet. Like, what would you like to wear today, flower? Um, There's no choices like that. It just says, God knows what you need. And is that enough? And why it's enough is that really all the stuff is just layers that are hiding what truly matters. When we buy into all the stuff, acquiring, getting to a higher place in life, getting the next degree, all of that, it's a race going nowhere. It's just staying on the surface of what doesn't matter and never really getting to the heart of what God has for us and who he is for us. And so when we have these two pictures, you know, something that... we want to look at is this verse that some of us may be familiar with in Matthew 6, 33. Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. We are invited to let go, like the birds and the flowers, of seeking first, well, when I get my bank account in a certain shape, when I get my house in a certain shape, when I get this job, when I get to a certain place, but to seek first God and his kingdom. You know, and in that, there is an invitation because, you know, in our world, we recognize, and one of our team was sharing this earlier, you know, but we live in a world, right, where acquiring is praised. It means you're moving up. It means you got it together. You have something in your bank account. You have stocks. You have investments. You now have a vacation home. You got in certain status. You got another degree. I mean, it's praised, isn't it? So it's really hard to say, is it really okay to not have this? People will think I'm crazy if I live 
wearing the basic same clothes all the time, or I live a lot more simply, or I still drive my 18-year-old car. Um, this, is, this won't look good at my business meeting. You know? And so there is that push and pull. But we live in a world of great disparity, don't we? In our world, we go to the grocery store, and there's more than 50 choices of cereal in colorful boxes that people have jobs to design to catch our attention so that we will buy them. And perhaps in our closets or in our pantry, we have many kinds of many things. But that's not true all over the world. In our world, there's people who don't even have a meal for the day. There are kids whose school is not an option. And when we buy into consumerism, and the grocery store and all the choices and, and think that choice is what matters and what we should have more of, we miss out on seeing what's really there and that God's invitation to us is he wants to redeem a world and he wants to make himself known to every single person on the planet and he wants to make all things right. His plan in Old Testament was that there would be no poor among you and yet there is poor among us. Why? Why, when there is actually enough wealth in the world so that no one can have poverty? It's because we are still acquiring and think we still don't have enough. And so when we practice simplicity, we strip ourselves of the enslavement to consumerism, to material things, to what people say is status matters and luxury, and we say, Lord, I want you and your kingdom what are you up to and where can I join you? And it frees us up, gives us interior space, heart space, time space to join him in those things. One thing to note about simplicity that I thought was important to mention that Richard Foster brings out is that asceticism is not the same thing as simplicity. Now, there's always people who go gung-ho in anything. So I just want to spell out that asceticism and simplicity are mutually incompatible. Asceticism is essentially living with nothing, right? Living bare bones on purpose because that is where you find your joy and pride in being a Christian. Um, that I'm suffering. You see how little I have. Oh, I don't ever go to and buy myself a cup of coffee, you know? Um, and it's on purpose a complete lifestyle of kind of bare bones punishment of self, thinking that that is holy. But that is not the heartbeat of simplicity. And so there's a chart here that might be really helpful to look at that compares asceticism and simplicity. And so if we can have that chart. Um, and so asceticism, when it looks at possessions, it renounces it. I don't need anything. Oh, I have barely anything. But simplicity looks at possessions in their proper perspective. God has given me this. What can I do with it? Um, Asceticism, there's no place for a land flowing with milk and honey, which is something God has promised. Anything good or pleasurable is looked at as not good, is looked at as unholy. The really holy person is the one that's constantly suffering. But simplicity is really, wow, sometimes there are good gifts. Sometimes there is an abundance. And to have room to receive as well as live simply it's a rejoicing, it's a free heart that when you receive something gracious from the hand of God, you can just rejoice. Like, thank you, God. It's just a joyfulness. And asceticism, uh, contentment only when it is a base, is that happiness that comes with like, yes, I'm going really low. And simplicity is, just like Paul says, um, whether you're bounding or having nothing to keep it really simple. And so asceticism and simplicity is not the same thing. And some of us, you know, we grew up in families where we didn't have much. And it's awkward for us when we can have something or when someone gifts us something. And it's the same heart, a sim simple heart. The practice of simplicity is an open hand posture, a recognizing whatever I have. It's not about grasping or trying to get more, but if I have it, wonderful. It is a gift. And recognizing that everything we have is a gift from God. And to have no control over it, to have no grasping of it, no trying to get it, but it's just a simple, thank you, Lord. Wow, this is more than I've had before. 
This is beautiful. Um, a second thing that simplicity is, if we can go to the next one, is trusting God to provide and care for what we have and what we need. And in this posture of open-handedness, it's about being a caretaker rather than an owner. It's, nothing is mine. I don't, this is not about me and my empire, but this is, Lord, what do I do with this? If I have an abundance, if I have a car, if I have an extra room in the house, Lord, what is this for? And without assuming that it's for me. If I get an extra bonus, what is this for, Lord? And recognizing that everything is from God and we're here to be caretakers. And in practicing simplicity, we get to see, because we're not in this constant race of needing more, needing more, we get to see, Lord, I see you at work here. I see the need there. And we get to partner with God in pursuing his kingdom come on earth. How beautiful is that? This is why we are the church, to be able to be free with what we have, not consumed with anxiety. So how do you know if you're living with simplicity? Quick questions are, are you free from anxiety? What have you been anxious about? A freedom of anxiety is an evidence that you are free to pay attention to God. How are you with your possessions? Are you concerned about them, constantly thinking about them? Un, you know, unable to give them? Do you feel you have a need to have to hold on to something? Are you holding tightly, don't want to share, greedy, stingy? How available are you when people are in need around you? How loose and how open are your hands? Essentially, simplicity invites us to a life of freedom. Church, we were not created to live enslaved, and money enslaves us. Our consumer culture enslaves us, and it blinds us to the reality of how much of the world is living. But we are called to be kingdom people with open hands, recognizing we've all been gifted so much. Anyone living in this world, in our part of the world, is, has so much. We are all rich. Even those of us who don't think we have, we're still so, so rich compared to much of the world. And we all have something to give and God has something so much more than giving us a nice house and a full closet and pantry for us. He has come for us through the blood of his own son, Jesus Christ, to send us on mission with him, in partnership with him, so that his righteousness would be experienced in so many of the spheres around us, government, politics, day-to-day, -day, our school system, all of that. And until we let go, it'll be really hard to see a church on the move. And we're invited to be in that. Let's pray. Lord, we come to you now, Lord, with open hands. Lord, um, we all carry different anxieties and concerns, and there are different responsibilities that weigh on each of us. But we want to recognize today that you are Lord over all. And you are a good, attentive father who knows what every single one of your children need. You pay attention to the birds and the flowers and ever so much more to each and every single one of us. So today we release to you our anxieties. We release to you our tight hold on the things that we possess. And we recognize that everything we have Every talent that we have, every relationship that we have is a gift from you. And Lord, we hold them lightly. Lord, we want to partner with you, so free us from the hold of things to see where you're at work, God. Lord, we want to see your kingdom come. We want to see righteousness on this earth. We want to see, Lord, poverty be removed, that everyone would have enough. Lord, meet us today and free us so we will not be slaves. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's stand and sing in response together.
to pray for, so much to invite God's presence into. So just invite you Tuesday through Thursday, 7.30 to 8.30, virtually online, to join us for that time of prayer. Um, and if I can invite our prayer team to come to my left here. Um, some of you, there's something that you want to bring before God. And so I invite you to come forward, to line up and have someone pray with you. What a gift to be able to pray together. And after service, if for those of you watching online, if you'd like to join us, we have a sermon discussion. And today, I believe Pastor Sharon will be there with one of our elders as well. And so if you can just click the sermon discussion button, you'll be able to join in a great time of conversation and digging into the word together. And some of you online, or maybe just in this room, you've never actually asked Jesus to be Lord, to be that master. And other things have been master. We're all following something. And today, you want to step into that freedom that Jesus has for you. God wants to pour out freedom for his children. We're not meant to be slaves. So if that's you today, I invite you to either text the words, yes to Jesus, to 718-424-0122, or come and meet with myself or any of our staff in the lobby. We'll be in the lobby. And now I just invite all of you to open your hands. This is what we do at the end of our services as a way of receiving from God. And we come before God for his blessing. So may the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. And may he turn his face towards you and give you peace. And as you walk out of this room, May you walk with the freedom that comes as a child of God, trusting and knowing that he has your back. He knows what you need. And he is inviting you to see and partner with him in bringing kingdom and righteousness. I bless you all in the strong, powerful, and beautiful name of Jesus. And the church said, amen.